questions. I can hardly see you guys, but if you have questions, like right off the bat, um, wave your hand up there, and I'll I'll kind of point you out and get you. But um, I can get us started. Uh, but just be warned, uh, I am a bit of a hawk. So <laughs> if you have a question, raise that hand, and we'll start it off here. Otherwise, it'll, I'll steal the show. Now, beautiful piece, sir. Um... I was wondering, can you tell us about the, what can you tell us about the bear scene, the logistics of that? <laughs> that always gets into the Q&A. What the question is about the bear scene. Um, that bear is named Joe Boxer, JB for short. Uh, J this is JB's second credit. He was in Into the Wild, also, uh, Sean Penn's movie. But no, um, we knew we wanted to have some wildlife in the movie, and I wrote the scene pretty much exactly as you saw it into the script, and when we got to Alaska, we um, found this guy named Mike Miller who runs the Anchorage Wildlife Conservation Center, which is this massive, huge refugee area for all sorts of wildlife there. And, and JB and a couple of other grizzlies um, were got rescued as cubs and, and were raised in a massive, like, miles deep enclosure. So that he's not a trained bear, you know, but he has used to having humans stare at him from the other side of a fence. Yeah. Um, for his whole life and, and been thrown food and whatnot. So we got there and, and Mike said, well, I can only bring in, you know, the two actors, Bruce Greenwood and, and Ella Purnell, and I can, you know, a few more. And so we put the camera team and Bruce and Ella. And so he brought this tractor around with a front loader, you know, like a bulldozer front loader on it. And he put Ella and Bruce and the camera team sitting in the front loader, picked it up and drove them into this big fenced in enclosure and we're filming inside the enclosure there that's how you can see how large it is that you can film inside you never know that you're actually in it and he so he drops them off in the enclosure and then mike gets out with a pitchfork and a bucket of hot dogs and fish <laughs> and um the other trainers like a mile away have somehow lured the other grizzlies that way and jb eventually smells these the food and comes wandering over and um, he starts getting closer and closer. And Mike's like, get out there and start filming. You know, and so Bruce being bold that he is and Ella just being young and you know, not knowing, they just get out there sort of close to JB and Hillary starts filming them. And, and then when JB gets too close, Mike throws a hot dog in the distance and JB turns around and walks away, <laughs> goes and gets the hot dog, comes back, then Mike throws a fish and keeps throwing. And so JB's just doing roundies while Ella and Bruce are sort of doing the scene and Hillary's filming, you know, every angle she could get. And um, and I was and I was standing on the other side of the fence with Ella's mom who was crying. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and um and, and, and actually J B did charge them. He did a if anyone you've ever seen like on Safari Channel, they he did this mock charge where they they rush for like ten feet and then they stop. I guess just to test the challenge. And uh, so that was pretty scary for everybody. Everybody ran except for except for Mike. So that's the bear story. Wow. They say yeah. not to work with children or animals. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> both, at, both. at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, question question really enjoyed the film. Um, Thanks. Very well done. I'm wondering if we were to buy the DVD, is there a deleted scene where Renee just beats the shit out of the uncle? <laughs> <laughs> There was not a deleted scene. I will tell you though that in a in an early version of the script, I didn't I didn't want to have um, Bartlett and the uncle really have a full-on confrontation for a couple of reasons. One, because I figured that's where the audience expected to go. It's like, oh, well, Bart and the uncle are going to conflict because that's what you know, in movies they have to do that. And I just didn't want to take you where you thought it would go. It also seemed um, like it was more fitting to sort of ask the question of what what's the best thing for Bart to do and to let you guys think about that question. What you know, what should Bart really do in that circumstance, and what's the best thing for the social issue. But in an early version of the script, he walks back to his car, he gets a tire iron out of the trunk, and he walks up to the door, he rings the doorbell, and he's holding this tire iron. And then, same thing here, uncle opens the door, you cut away, and you know you never see what happens. And so people would read the script and go, oh, I love how he kills him in the end. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's standing at the door with the tire iron. So that version of the script obviously conveyed a lot of violence, and I just thought that it wasn't what I wanted to say necessarily. But um, you can have in your mind that version <laughs> if you like. <laughs> um, we'll go back there, and then you're next. Um, so speaking on uh, the character of Uncle Mike, 
and I hope this doesn't come off sounding kind of creepy, but I think it was a really great decision. Now, so frequently in movies where you're dealing with that kind of abuse, it, it's easy to make the character like just this evil, creepy, crotchety old man who, you know, is just doing, like, we see him and we know, oh, that's somebody I hate. And this one, it was not that direction. It was so, I think, so much more natural, so much more realistic, so much more evil that it's just, it's something that just kind of happened. It was just, you know, it, it wasn't evil machinations. It was just, it was just evil. And I, I really appreciate that. Thanks, I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah, um, I can understand how you don't want to necessarily make that comment or that question. And, um, and we actually had a, an incident at one film festival where I was trying to explain the same issue and an audience member said, he's a monster, and she got up and stormed out. You know, and understandably so, because he's a total monster. But if you think about it, the way I wrote the script was, and based on the research and people that I talked to, which were a lot, it can be anybody. So for me to paint this sort of stereotypical person who looks like the guy that's going to do it is a complete disservice to the reality of it. Because the reality of it is that it, it, you cannot identify the perpetrator until after it happens. And that's actually part of the problem with the issue. So one of the things I really did want to do is I wanted to show that, hey, if he had not crossed this line, if he was not a pedophile or he was not sick in this way, he actually would be a completely decent, perfect caretaker for her. But, you know, he is that person. And, and you know, they do exist. And so I, I wanted to... Exactly. Yeah. So he's representative of that. So I appreciate you identifying that. Thanks. Can you uh, talk about choosing Bruce and Ella for the movie? Sure. Um, Bruce came on real, real late in the project, just about four weeks before we started shooting. It was a hard role to cast, just because particular age range, we definitely wanted a level of experience. Also, we wanted somebody who, who brought a recognizable name to the picture. We had a, a group of actors. Bruce was on the list for a long time. And um, you know, so finally we sent him the script, and, um, and he, he just responded to it. He really liked it, and he called me, and we had like a two-hour conversation. And you know, he just we went through the entire script, and he asked me so many different questions, and, and pressed me on a lot of issues, and, and quizzed me, and we, and we fought, and but we had a great time. And at the end of the call, he said, "I'll see you in Alaska." <laughs> and hung up the phone, and two weeks later, you know, he was there, and. Um, and he's become a close friend. He's really terrific to work with. He's also a very funny guy. He's like a Jim Carrey. Ella, um, she's British um, from London, and um, she came on like two years before we filmed. Um, I got casting her role early, and I had a casting director, and I met agents. I went to LA, and I had all these meetings with different young aspiring actresses and girls in Hollywood and a bunch of different agencies. and. Um, I met, keep meeting these girls who were like on Nickelodeon or they'd been on the Disney Channel or whatever, and it just wasn't the right person. <laughs> it just wasn't the right gravitas, yeah, for the role. You know, and obviously I wanted to do something that had some level of authenticity to it, and I just couldn't find the right person. I went back to my hotel room and was literally exhausted. And I turned on the TV and I started watching this movie called Never Let Me Go, which is a British film with Carrie Mulligan and Andrew Garfield and Kira Knightley. And, Kira Knightley has a younger version of her character played by Ella. I saw her on the TV for all of five minutes, and I was like, that is her. And uh, yeah, and exactly, find her. And so I just looked her up on IMDb, and, and um, I had actually met with her agent in LA that day. So I sent the agent a text at like midnight, and got on the phone with the agent, and was like, I don't know why you didn't show me Ella Purnell. She's like, well, she's British. And so can she do an American accent? She, oh, of course, yeah, she can do an American accent. So I think immediately Ella started learning an American accent. Um, but to Ella's credit, she did. She got off the plane in Anchorage and started speaking American English 24-7 for six weeks until she got back on the plane to go to London. And that was pretty impressive. Mm. Yeah, it was somewhat deliberately. It came out stronger, I think, than I intended, but it was definitely a red herring, yeah. And it, it works that way, so it works fine. So, over here? Yeah. And I'm happy to stick around up here and people can come up and ask me questions. What inspired this film for you? Where did it originate for you? Thanks. Story. Yeah. Um, a few different places. Um, the 
the social issue in the movie, the, the sexual abuse, um, was something that, you know, at, at first sort of pinged me as an issue a long time ago. I knew a girl who told me a story that was very intimate, and it just sort of struck me. And then, and then I kept having these circumstantial things happen on the periphery, met other people, you know, that had the same issue. I had a, a family member that worked with predators um, that had come out of prison, and that was a really enlightening um, conversation. And then articles and things that I would see, I would find myself interested in, so I just, as I started planning my first feature, and I wanted to do something with, you know, with Gravitas, I, I, I felt like that, some, maybe the universe was saying, go for it, try to tackle this issue. And um, at the same time, um, I'm an outdoorsman, I'm an avid backpacker, and I'd gone to Denali in 2003 with my wife Molly, gone on an eight-day backpacking trip to some of the exact same locations you see in the movie, we rode that bus. And um, so it, Alaska as a state and Denali became a, a backdrop in my mind, like this is, this is a great place to set a film, and I knew I wanted to set a film in the outdoors, and I also knew that I wanted to tell a story about a young person that, that goes out from what they know, that goes on a trajectory, ideally into nature, but also maybe into a different social scenario where they're put in circumstances that allow them to share and, and to trust in a way that they wouldn't normally. So it, I mean, literally all those things were a confluence as I was just coming up with the idea. But thanks for asking. I'm afraid we're out of yeah. time, but uh, 